honorable ministers, distinguished colleagues, friends, I wish you all a warm welcome to our Race for Nature and Health event organized by WHO in collaboration with a vast number of partners and all the panelists joining us here today as a part of the first series of dialogues of the Race to Zero events aimed at achieving the goal of zero carbon recovery and net zero emissions by 2050. My name is Christina Romanelli and I work with the WHO Environment, Climate Change and Health Department. And I could not possibly be more pleased to engage with all of you in this session, placing health, climate change and nature at the forefront of our discussions. At WHO, we're deeply committed to achieving net zero emissions while safeguarding nature, which must go hand in hand with a healthy and just recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The six pillars of the WHO manifesto for a healthy recovery is a true testament to these commitments. And this session really goes to the core of that first pillar, which is safeguarding nature as the foundation for human health. In this session, two keynote speakers will begin by setting the scene for this dialogue before we take a deeper dive into some of the cross-cutting themes at the climate, health, and nature nexus, including infectious diseases, food systems, healthy cities, and nature-based solutions, using a systems lens to engage with all actors, from local communities to indigenous people to global actors. As participants, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions to panelists in a brief exchange. And please feel free to use the chat box uh, to submit your questions throughout the dialogue. And please do make them brief and concise. A few housekeeping items. If you wish to follow the dialogue in French or Spanish, you can change the channel on your screens below and incur and we encourage you to share the important messages you'll hear today to ensure maximum outreach on social media using the hashtags race to zero and healthy recovery, which I believe will also be shared with you in the chat box. So we have an exceptional array of speakers with, with us here today, and I'm sure you are all as eager as I am to hear about how we can all meaningfully raise ambition for climate action place health at the center of this imperative for action and the role of nature in making these objectives a reality. So without further ado, I am extremely pleased to introduce to you our first distinguished speaker, Her Excellency Carolina Schmidt, Chile's Minister of Environment, Dear ministers, authorities, and friends, it's a real pleasure to address you for this session of the November 2020 Race to Zero High Ambition Alliance Dialogues on Climate and Health. Global warming is the most important challenge we face as a generation. Fighting it decisively is an ethical challenge and has been one of the focus of our work. As we know, the pace of the demographic change over the past 50 years has been unprecedented. The human population has doubled. The global economy expanded fourfold and more than one billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. However, this remarkable growth and prosperity has come at a heavy cost to the natural systems that underpin life on Earth. Biodiversity loss adversely impact the health and well-being of billions of people by threatening the most fundamental health needs. Clean air, safe water, sufficient food, physical shelter, and disease prevention. The science is clear. The climate change and nature loss are inextricably interlinked. Current patterns of production and consumption land use, trade, industry, and governance models exacerbate biodiversity loss. While COVID-19 has postponed COP26, it has not postponed the urgent need for climate action. 
updating NDCs is not an unnecessary distraction from the pandemic. On the contrary, new updated NDCs can be a blueprint that guides a truly sustainable and healthy economic recovery from COVID-19. In this period, in April this year, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, Chile presented a significant enhanced NDC that in line with the Paris Agreement targets a long-term vision of carbon neutrality by 2050. Our NDC set out a series of commitments spanning mitigation, adaptation, and integrative action on oceans, forests, circular economy, finance, and nature-based solutions. Importantly, it specifically commits us to a 25% reduction in black carbon emission by 2030 that would strongly reduce air pollution that affect more than 5 million people in my country. Health and climate action are absolutely interlinked. As we know, 2020 will be a year marked by COVID-19, but also by how governments step up to take decisive climate action in these challenging circumstances to ensure that the reactivation of our economies is accelerating our transition to a zero carbon neutral future. We have a unique opportunity, use it, to bring health to our people, to give a more inclusive, low carbon and resilient economy for the world. Thank you. Wow, a powerful statement with many, many thanks to Minister Schmidt for providing a powerful example of how Chile is working toward meeting its climate commitments by integrating health in its NDCs. And thank you for reminding us that one of the five key objectives of the COP26 pres presidency, which was also a priority for Chile's uh, COP25 presidency, in fact, is to protect and restore nature and the natural habitats and ecosystems on which our climate, air, water, our health and livelihood depend. This is actually a perfect and inspiring segue into our next keynote speaker. We have the honor of having among us the guardian in chief of biodiversity, Ms. Elizabeth Maruma Mrema, uh, Executive Secretary of the Secretariat for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Ms. Marema, you have the floor. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, distinguished participants. It is clear that human health is intimately interconnected with the health of our planet, and that health, climate change, biodiversity, need to be addressed together and in an in interconnected way. COVID-19 pandemic has clearly shown us that continuing loss of biodiversity and degradation of our ecosystems on a global scale represents a direct threat to our health and well-being. The recent IPBS report on biodiversity and pandemic, which I'm sure the details will listen later, has clearly shown us that unsustainable production and consumption has led to the one-term destruction and fragmentation of ecosystems that allows virulent diseases to emerge and strive. This tells us that the path forward to human well-being and sustainable future we want lies in policies that tackle biodiversity loss, climate change, and land degradation. We all know that addressing climate change and biodiversity loss are in fact two sides of the same coin. We also know that climate change is projected to have dramatic negative impacts on species and ecosystems. We equally know that nature-based solutions to climate change represents as much as 30% of the solutions proposed under the Paris Agreement. Therefore, we need to look at three-way conversation on solutions for climate change, health, and biodiversity. All human health ultimately depends 
on ecosystem services that are made possible by biodiversity and the products derived from them. While the interlinkages between biodiversity, ecosystem services, and human health are inherently complex, interdisciplinary research is continuing to develop a more thorough understanding of these essential relationships. The work of the Convention on Biological Diversity together with the World Health Organization to promote the One Health Policy approach is a significant step to integrating and mainstreaming biodiversity to human health. One Health is a collaborative, multi-sectorial and in transdisciplinary approach working at local, regional, national to global levels with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnectedness between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. One health approach also recognizes that health of the people is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. Growth and expansion of human population leads into more people getting in close contact with the wild and domestic animals. Close contact with wild and their environments provide also more opportunities for diseases to emerge and pass from animals to people. Disruption in environmental conditions and habitats due to deforestation, intensive farming, and climate change are also providing new opportunities for diseases to pass from animals to humans. Increased international travel and trade helps further to accelerate this with the consequences that COVID-19 have laid here. It will make sense to ensure that the 2021 Global Conference on Health and Climate Change to be convened at the margins of the COP26 of the UN Climate Change Conference is fully inclusive of the biodiversity agenda in view of the interconnectedness of these issues. And we will commit to working with our colleagues at the World Health Organization to bring biodiversity to the table. In finishing today, I seek your help to bring biodiversity, climate change, and human health together to find common solutions to many of the interconnected problems facing humanity today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Maremma, for setting out so clearly how biodiversity loss, climate change, and health are inextricably linked. And um, not only in terms of their drivers, but also in their solution pathways and how safeguarding nature really is central to achieving climate and health co-benefits. And just as climate change continues to devastate our health, our economies and societies, biodiversity continues to be eroded at an unprecedented scale. And this session is a powerful reminder and your statement is a powerful reminder of why that matters to our health and well being and the many ways in which it modulates health outcomes through the water we drink, the air we breathe, and of course, the food we eat. But biodiversity is an integral part of the solution moving forward. And with that, I'm very pleased to launch new WHO guidance on mainstreaming biodiversity for nutrition and health, which does just that. Prevailing food systems are unquestionably a leading cause of both cl climate change and biodiversity loss, with approximately one third of the world's land surface and nearly 75% of freshwater resources now devoted to crop and livestock production. The glo global food system is also responsible for up to one third of human induced greenhouse gas emissions globally and is a major source of soil, air and water pollution. But this dysfunctional food system 
is not only eroding biodiversity, is not only contributing to climate change. It's also a leading cause of malnutrition in all its forms. Unhealthy diets are a leading cause of morbidity, morbidity and mortality and has been estimated to be responsible for approximately 11 million premature adult deaths in 2017. So the new guidance that we're launching here today presents six core building blocks for mainstreaming biodiversity to improve health outcomes while building resilience to climate change by, for instance, promoting indigenous crop varieties, improving sustainable post-harvesting methods, um, shifting away from unsustainable, unsustainable consumption and production patterns um, from and from animal sourced products in high meat consumption uh, societies toward less emission intensive sources that are all, all of these are critically important steps toward achieving healthy and sustainable diets while raising ambition, both for biodiversity and for climate change. And with this, we move to our next set of speakers, um, Marco Lambertini, who is the Director General of WWF International, and Peter Dazak, who is the President of EcoHealth Alliance. So I would like to begin first with Mr. Lambertini. Marco, if I may, in your Hello, view. Christina. Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, in your view, how are the nature, climate and health crises interlinked? building on what um, Elizabeth has just said. Christina, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be joining this conversation, such an important uh, and exciting topic. Uh, and in fact, almost a new discovery for us as, as a civilization, the nexus between climate nature and human health. First of all, let me just say, the evidence has never been clearer. We, we, we today know that we are destabilizing climate and losing nature and biodiversity at a shocking rate. And actually, we're beginning to understand this is a dangerous rate as well. We are driving one million species to extinction. We have uh, seen a two third decline in global wildlife population in less than 50 years. We have passed the one degree of global temperature rise. Um, we have lost half of the forest, half of the coral reefs, 80% of the wetlands. And we could, I could continue. And I know you know all these figures, but I think it's always important to remind ourselves the seriousness of the impact of our activities uh, on the natural systems. But the exciting thing in, in, in all this uh, it's list of bad news is that we're actually beginning to understand uh, the consequences uh, of all this to us. And that's that's new. That's something that um, uh, is emer has, has emerged in the last uh, a, a few several years. So um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's not just about um, failing on our duty to moral duty to coexist with nature we are beginning to understand that our our impact on the planet is actually threatening our uh, our climate our food our water and uh, as the covid-19 crisis has again uh, highlighted to us also our health but also we are beginning to understand as elizabeth mentioned um, the link between uh, 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 particularly nature and climate have been treated in isolation for too long. And, uh, and now we understand that today they're connected into a negative feedback kind of loop where a climate change is affecting nature and biodiversity and the loss of nature is exacerbating climate change. That understanding is important because um, we really need to see uh, discussions that are integrating action both for climate and for nature. And then, of course, the COVID pandemic has highlighted the link to uh, uh, between natural degradation, uh, in particular, and, and human health. And uh, and this is something also that we knew from before, but perhaps this pandemic has really brought into focus our our uh, the need to to reset our relationship with nature, and particularly a number of uh, economic sectors like food production and consumption that uh, that are clearly clearly at the at the foundation of this of this uh, unbalanced uh, relationship. So, and there's still bad news uh, all over the place, but uh, what is exciting is that the awareness never been greater. And I think we're beginning now to understand the consequence. So we are not anymore sad about nature loss. We're beginning to be worried and therefore beginning to take action. We have 
main examples of that. Well, thank you so much, Marco, for exposing that so clearly. Um, and uh, I, I think that, as you say, it's indisputable that uh, COVID-19 has really brought into sharp focus what is really at stake if we don't safeguard our natural systems and how this will ultimately have very far-reaching consequences for human health. So to delve further into that theme, I'd like to bring in uh, your co-panelists as well. Uh, I'd like to turn to Peter Dazak to tell us a little more about what are the key drivers of ecological de degradation, climate change, and infectious disease outbreaks. Well, thanks, Christina. Thanks, Mark. What a great pleasure to be talking to this um, important um, mission that links health and the environment. And what we found is if, if we look at the history of pandemics over the last 100 years or so, um, these are caused by emerging diseases, mainly viruses, and almost entirely ones that originate or have some connection to wildlife or to livestock or both. And what we found is that by analyzing the history of, of disease emergence, is that there are a couple of really key lessons. One is that the causes of these diseases emerging and spreading, and ultimately some of them becoming pandemics, is really our activities on the planet. Our growth in population, driving land use change, climate change, the wildlife trade, um, intensifying agriculture, expanding agriculture, and creating this perfect system through which a pathogen can spread into people. And of course, as well as our connection, uh, our increasing connection with wildlife um, in an unsustainable way through things like the wildlife trade, we then have a global um, travel and trade network that allows viruses an incredible capacity to spread. And that's exactly what we saw with COVID-19. It emerged probably from rural Southeast Asia or Southwest China, um, where land use change is happening at an unprecedented rate. It got into a wildlife market system and trade system, which is unsustainable and largely unregulated and spread, and then got into a city and, and then emerged uh, globally and caused incredible damage. Now, the economic damages of pandemics are a real lesson. We've seen global economies crash with COVID-19, but we estimate that pandemics, and this is in an IPBEST report that's just been published, and the cost of them is about a trillion dollars a year to our, um, to our global economy. And if you think about the underlying drivers, if we can do something about the unsustainable um, expansion of the wildlife trade and the land use change um, to try and reduce pandemics, to try and prevent them, a transformational change, we estimate that the costs of doing those activities will be between 22 and $31 billion a year, even less if you um, accept that reducing deforestation increases carbon sequestration and adds to the dollar benefit. So by, by investing in sustainable future, we get three impacts. We get reduced carbon dioxide, land, uh, climate change, increased biodiversity conservation, and less emerging diseases and pandemics. It's better for our health. It's better for our planet's health. And back to you, Christine, you may be on mute. Thank you so much for that really compelling over, overview, Peter, as always. Um, and I, I'd like to prod you a little bit more on that. And in your experience as the chair of the recent report on uh, biodiversity and pandemics that was released by the uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So you mentioned that prevention is far less costly than response as the current pandemic has indeed shown. But what is it that really needs to be done to achieve a healthy and sustainable post COVID-19 recovery? You know, it, it's been a very frustrating um, year for all of us working in, the, in, in this pandemic and, and on, the, on the boundaries with um, ecology and ecosystems. 
because we know that prevention is far more effective than, than our current strategy. Our current global strategy to pandemics is to say, let's wait for them to emerge and then we'll design our way out of it. We'll have vaccines and drugs. We'll use new technology. They'll, they'll come even quicker and they'll save us. But that's not a strategy. That's just a waiting game. And, and yet there's so much known about the drivers of emerging diseases that we can use to prevent pandemics. So what we're calling for in the EPBES report, and we're laying out a series of policy options, is really transformative change and understanding that we can move towards preventing pandemics. And we come out with a series of enabling mechanisms that could be taken on board. For instance, uh, you know, a, a new um, um, intergovernmental panel or, or council on preventing pandemics where organizations like WHO, C, uh, you know, CBD and others come together to say, what can we do to prevent and how can we work together? Um, a platform that brings the health and the trade agencies together. We know that OA and CITES um, focus on these trades and have their own niche that they do incredibly well. Let's try and find a way to bring um, a protection against the health risks of trade like the wildlife trade, make it sustainable, make it healthy and safe. Um, things will happen. There have already been lots of calls for change, but we need to work together among the agencies, among the intergovernmental communities to do this in a way that's sustainable and that, and that we can show real value to the public. We will see that value. And we have a, you know, one last point, we have a short time period to move because Today, there's an announcement that one of the vaccines is, it looks like it's gonna be effective. People will soon forget. I think we'll all be surprised at how quickly people will forget about how important preventing pandemics is. And they'll say, well, don't worry, we got a vaccine to COVID. So we'll get a vaccine to the next one. It's the bit between the outbreak and the vaccine that I'm worried about and the continued destruction of our ecosystems. We've, we've got a, um, a period of time now when we have the world listening, we have the momentum, we need to push very strongly on these issues. Thanks. Indeed we do. Thank you very, very much, Peter, for that, uh, for, for, for that, that very compelling way forward. And uh, if I can turn back just very, very briefly to Marco. As... Um, as you've been driving at WWF this new deal for people and nature, in addition to, can you build on some of what Peter has said and tell us how we can catalyze uh, meaningful transformative change? Peter had talked about transformative change. How can the new deal for people and nature uh, catalyze transformative change and help us to achieve um, the uh, a decarbonized a decarbonized economy. Yeah, Christina, thank you. Um, and um, um, so I think um, the first osmosis change that we need to ensure is perhaps in our minds, in our heads, uh, because uh, because they've been taking nature for granted for so long, and I think we've got to be really. Uh, we've got to begin to realize and, and act, act accordingly on the basis that nature is a fundamental asset for the stability and the productivity of the systems that we all depend on. This seems to be uh, a, an abstract statement, but actually is a fundamental one, because unless we begin to really value nature for what it gives us every day for free, most of the time, we, we won't take care of it in the way that we should. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is that we need to actually then turn that new awareness and new cultural awakening, if you like, of the importance of nature, the value of nature, into a proper plan. And, uh, and actually, we have started already a transition in society towards um, a, 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 a climate-friendly and, and a nature-friendly uh, uh, um, economy and society. But we have to accelerate. We have to accelerate through embracing a clear plan we clear uh, 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 a problem statement that, uh, as I said earlier, is, is pretty obvious today. Science has never been clearer on that, but particularly a destination. So we need a, a north, north star and a southern cross a direction for, for, for all of us uh, in the world, for uh, a government, for businesses, for individuals, to really align our behaviors to a carbon neutral and a nature positive uh, uh, future, a, a future where carbon uh, is is emissions are, are net zeroed and 
where we can stabilize climate and if in the future where we're going to have more nature than today none less so we stop stop uh, uh, holding uh, hold uh, loss on nature uh, by uh, the end of this decade we know that this is possible to do both but we need a plan for that and that's what the new deal for nature and people means to uh, represent a common plan globally universally adopted around next year great big important decision around climate around ocean around biodiversity all that needs to come together as part of one shared global common goal carbon neutral nature positive in a plan with targets and timeline that delivers it uh, that's what we need it's a cultural evolution and a plan concrete plan attached to it to deliver it Thank you very much, Mark, Marco. It's very clear. We definitely need a clear plan and we need a clear destination. And to build on what you're saying, I'm going to turn to our next set of speakers, Carolina Urrutia, uh, Secretary of the Environment of the City of Bogota, and Pinari Webb, uh, founder of a truly remarkable NGO called Health in Harmony. Ms. Uh, Urrutia, I turn to you first on how we can meaningfully catalyze action. How can we develop a clear plan, as Marco has just said, at the city level based on the experience in Bogota? And how can we meaningfully integrate nature-based solutions in urban settings with a view to maximizing health outcomes? Christina and everyone, thank you so much for this invitation. This is a topic that is really strategic and prioritary for Bogota. We've included it in our local development plan. And as we go forward with our city uh, land use plan over that's going to be uh, in use over the next 12 years, these nature-based solutions really become an option, not for the future, but for the present. So, I think first, uh, the first of our tasks is to is, is kind of opposed to what Christina just said, or, or kind of complementary, because what we have to do is acting while planning. We can't wait until we have a new paper, of, a new diagnosis. A new, we already know what we have to do. And in a way, science has gone ahead and set our goals for us. So we don't really have to work that hard on figuring out um, whether we have to incorporate nature-based solutions or what we have to go is directly into the how. <laughs> and that's our big challenge with climate change and with biodiversity, not only with cities, but across the board. I think we've been spending the past, I don't know, 10, 12 years thinking and getting documents together and documents can always be improved and we can always have new versions and you know new data that's going to enrich our perspective but we kind of have to divide um, our responsibilities and have the academy and the multilateral institutions kind of work on the technical uh, information and get it to the decision makers as quick as possible but i do think decision makers at this at the current juncture really just have to focus on what we have to do and start doing it today not tomorrow not, not next year and that's the big challenge we, in the urban setting because so far I think nature-based solutions in, outside the academic setting have been mainly thought of, especially in Latin America, in terms of the, the rural areas or where biodiversity truly lies. And one of the challenges we have here in Bogota is to reframe what urban biodiversity means and actually um, find the flexibility and the space where urban planning and the needs of an 8 million cities such as Bogota meet the fact that we are a major city in one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. And therefore, we're not strictly speaking one of the most biodiverse cities in the world, but we do have a, a lot of biodiversity and we do have to make choices that underscore a, our, our options and our competitive advantages in terms of being a biodiversity. When we think about tourism, people that are stopping here to go bird watching across the country, they can bird watch here. All these alternatives in terms of thinking that losing green spaces and green areas in the cities are just a natural product you know, of urban development. And it has to happen. Of course, cities have to grow and we have to be flexible in terms of how we plan but integrating nature-based solutions into um, our matrix of solutions is really um, 
what we have to do. <laughs> we, we don't have time to, to get to, to sort of have more and better information. I think we already have the information we need. There's one area in particular, as you all know, for in the urban setting, which is particularly um, a priority, which is air quality. Um, and I think we, even though a lot of the evidence is not really definitive in terms of how trees work with air pollution and whether particulate matter is, it, it can be controlled just in general by green spaces. There's so much of the nitty gritty detail that has to go in terms of what trees we plant where and whether they're good to, to, um, to contain particulate matter or not. What we do know is that uh, even though cargo transport is one of the main issues that we deal terms, uh, what we deal with in terms of air quality, we also know that the resuspension of particulate matter is, accounts for at least 60% for our air pollution in the city. So even though we can sit down and work with academics and with our tree experts and our forestry experts in terms of what species are really ideal, what we know is that the more um, grass that we have instead of dust, we're going to have better air quality. So let's just go ahead and do that instead of waiting for the perfect species to, to arise. And I think that's um, a big part of what we have to do uh, for both climate change and biodiversity loss and two topics in which nature-based solutions seems to be like the best meeting point in terms of public policy. A second issue that I think is key and that we don't have enough evidence of, um, I think at the global level or we haven't found enough is the relationship between cities and the way we're going about agricultural production in our rural areas. When the pandemic began in Bogota, we were in the midst of one of, we usually have air quality crises between February and March every year because of climate issues. And that exact same thing happened this year, but we were shocked to find that even though the city had shut down and our, and our economy was really uh, shut down, our air quality did not improve for at least two weeks. And what we found was that Agricultural fires and forest fires from up to Venezuela in the southeast and the north uh, west of the country were actually polluting Colombia's three main cities in ways that we hadn't found a way to isolate before. This was uh, in a way the only chance, let's hope, that we were going to get to analyze how far a particulate matter from the rural areas was actually affecting our cities. So I think this issue that is going to be fortunately um, a good means to talk about forest fires and agricultural pro production in an urban setting and make urban dwellers more aware of how deforestation and bad agricultural practices are affecting, of course, not only climate change and, and land use cover, but actually air quality and human health as well. And I think a third factor that is really important is that when we do speak about nature-based solutions in cities, we have to take into account that no matter how we evolve and how much we start prioritizing um, biodiversity in the urban setting, cities are going to be more hostile environments towards nature-based solutions. And we have to find uh, the most um, resilient species and areas and um, land coverings to ensure that these solutions are actually long-term and that we're not investing in means in, in, in projects that are actually too short-lived to have true impact in those issues that most matter to us. So those are the three things that I think we have to take into account when we make these issues real. Talking about the linkages between air quality and, and, and uh, green areas in our cities. And now that we've been shut in our apartments uh, for such a long time, mental health, which is an issue we've, we're really trying to stress here in Bogota. How important are green areas and nature in terms of mental health for urban dwellers? And we're really working on these three issues very hard. I do think we've taken um, the challenge very seriously in terms of uniting the climate change and biodiversity agendas. It's often not, not easy to do that in a very robust and technical way, but I think uh, in Bogota, we're advancing towards that. Wow, thank you very, very much, Carolina, for um, really making very clear how cities can take a, a, a real leadership role, if you will, in harnessing uh, nature-based solutions to achieve sort of net, net zero by 2050 on the one hand, 
but also to address many um, key drivers of ill health. You mentioned uh, mental health and how nature-based solutions can contribute to that. And very, very importantly, you also drew our attention to air pollution, a real silent killer, not just in Bogota, but in cities worldwide. Globally, it's now killing an estimated 7 million people every year prematurely. So it really is something to consider and nature-based solutions can be, um, can, can significantly contribute to overcoming that uh, health challenge. So thank you very, very much for that. And um, now I would like to uh, turn my next question to Kinari Webb. What about civil society? What role can civil society play as the founder of Health and Harmony? Could you tell us a little bit about your own experience and maybe share a way in a way forward or a best practice for advancing nature-based solutions to maximize health and climate co-benefits, not only in highly urbanized areas um, such as Bogota, but also in rural areas where people are so often very much on the front lines of natural, natural resource management. Thank you, Christina. It's an honor to be here with all this amazing panelists. Um, I, you know, I want to start just by saying something that we all, that everyone's been saying, but that we often forget. We are nature. Our human health totally depends on the health of the natural world around us. And the WHO has that beautiful definition of health um, as a comprehensive state of physical, social, and mental well being, which sort of implies a connectedness to nature, but global health for decades has just been focusing on this one species, us, Homo sapiens, and has been neglecting, as lots of people have been saying, our interdependence with the natural world and the ecological determinants of health. But so the first point I wanna make is just fundamental. There's no long-term health for humans without healthy nature, but also this is where it gets really interesting. We found it goes the other way as well. If humans aren't healthy, they can't protect nature. So I founded Health and Harmony 15 years ago on the basis that the health of humans, ecosystems, and the planet needed to all be just together. But I didn't learn this myself. It was the communities around the Voyeur Forest where I actually studied orangutans as an undergraduate who taught me this. So the way we work improves human well-being. It reverses poverty. It protects clim climate, uh, critical climate ecosystems, the rainforest, and it draws carbon dioxide down from the atmosphere. And it does that all at the same time. And while it might sound daunting or even impossible to accomplish several critical sustainable development goals all at the same time, it turned out it wasn't actually that hard. So I also, before I get into what we did, I just wanna tell you all that we really have the evidence to back up what we've done and that it really works. So just last week, researchers at Stanford published a 10-year impact analysis of our work um, at our first site in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. And those Stanford researchers showed that between 2007 and 2017, when Health and Harmony invested 5.2 million US dollars in these communities around this precious national park called Gunung Palong, and there's about 120,000 people around that park, there was this just intensely dramatic impact. First, the loss of 65 million US dollars worth of rainforest carbon in that primary forest was averted. There was a 90% drop in logging households and infant mortality decreased 67%. And that carbon number that I just gave you, it doesn't even count the 52,000 acres of secondary rainforest that regrew during that time period increasing the habitat for 3,000 endangered Bornean orangutans and countless other species. In addition, what the Stanford researchers found was that the more the we are partner organization in Indonesia that I also helped found, um, the more we engaged with the communities, the faster the logging dropped. That's planetary health in action. And it's a new paradigm for health systems strengthening worldwide. So 
we're basically a case study of how interdependent programs can be designed, implemented, and evaluated. And it shows that we can address multiple SDGs all at the same time. So we, we basically addressed um, our um, uh, life on land, which is 15, health, three, climate action, 13, decent work and economic growth, eight, and partnership for the goals, which is 17. So we've actually already expanded our work to um, working besides communities in another national park in Borneo, one in Southeast Madagascar and in the Shingu River Basin of the Brazilian Amazon. And our goal is to help reverse the loss of millions of hectares of tropical rainforest, which will help cur curb global heating. So how do we do this? What's our unique framework? Well, first, and this is the most important point I wanna get across. We are not the experts. When it coming, comes to knowing how to live in balance with rainforest ecosystems, rainforest communities are the experts. So we enter these communities and practice a methodology that we call radical listening. We start by asking people this simple question. We say, you all are, this, are the guardians of a precious rainforest that's valuable to the whole planet. How might the world community assist you to live in balance with this rainforest? as a thank you for your guardianship of it. When we learned the people of Borneo had almost no other economic opportunities except to log and sell rainforest trees. And the critical re reason for that was to afford their healthcare and medical emergencies, which might cost an entire year's income. The connection between human well-being and ecosystem integrity was that direct. And it's a reality we see in tropical rainforests from Brazil to Madagascar to the Philippines. As one woman said to me, if anyone tells you they haven't logged to pay for healthcare, they're lying. During our radical listening meetings in Madagascar, Malagasy communities said that they would need mobile clinics and training in regenerative rice farming techniques if they were gonna live in balance with the rainforest and protect lemurs. And in Brazil, the Xingu River Basin communities said that without healthcare access, it was very hard for them to stay on their land and protect the rainforest from invaders. They also wanted help advocating for high school education for their children. Luckily, they're already working with a mar remarkable Brazilian organization that we're partnered with called Instituto Socioambiental that is helping them with their economic well being. So that was not as great a need for them. But in each location, Health and Harmony is heeding the wi their wisdom and investing precisely in their sector agnostic systems oriented designs. In order to improve their health, the health of the rainforest ecosystems and the health of the planet. We have, this work has clear global health implications. Human health, ecosystem integrity and the climate can and must be addressed in unison and under the control of local indigenous communities. And we know it has to scale globally and quickly given the enormous threats to the health of our planet. So I wanna leave you with two calls to action. Caring for people's health is a prescription, I'm a doctor, <laughs> for protecting rainforest and slowing the climate crisis. That is the paradigm that guides health and harmony. This proven framework is also a workable model that governments and national health systems can adopt worldwide. And two, we need to listen to and follow the guidance of local traditional indigenous communities who know best what is required to live in balance with their forest or other ecosystems. Globally, about 35% of protected areas are traditionally owned, managed, used, or occupied by indigenous and local communities. Yet rarely do we ask them to design the best solutions. Sometimes we ask them for their, their input on the solutions that have already been designed but we don't ask them to design them in the first place. By contrast, we have shown that when this is done, remarkable outcomes ensue. As one village leader in Borneo said to me once, he said, we are the pathfinders for where the world needs to go to live in balance with the environment. And now we wanna teach the world. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to share their wisdom. That was beautiful, Kinnery. Thank you so, so much for sharing that experience with us um, and for emphasizing the crucial role of community engagement, working with indigenous and lo local communities, radical listening, uh, the need for 
a holistic and inclusive vision and to achieve the SDGs and to maximize health and well-being, um, at, including at the community level. And Actually, I say today we are going to give a voice to uh, Indigenous and local communities specifically so that they themselves can tell us how they uh, have and would design um, effective nature-based solutions. So for that, I turn to our next two speakers, Alejandro Argumedo who is the program director of the, of the Asociación Andes, and Maria Yolanda Teran Maywa, an indigenous woman from the Kichwani region of Ecuador, representing the Indigenous Women's Biodiversity Network from Latin America and the Caribbean. I think both speakers can really speak to the excellent points you just raised, Kinari, in a very, very intimate way. So with that, I now turn to Alejandro. Gracias. Yes, you have an intimate experience of how indigenous peoples are essential custodians of biodiversity um, and central to building climate resilient, resilience while safeguarding health and well-being. Um, and there's a remarkable example, I believe, precisely designed by indigenous peoples of a potato park in Peru, which is a remarkable initiative that, that, that has been spearheaded by local communities. And um, I believe contributed not only to strengthening food security and nutrition, but also to building social and ecological resilience, including in the midst of the uh, current COVID-19 pandemic. So can you please tell us a little bit more about this uh, project and about the important role of indigenous people in transforming the food system? Gracias. Voy a hablar en español. Entonces, um, eh, agradezco la oportunidad. Um, eh, mira, el, paradójicamente durante la pandemia acá en el Cusco donde estoy, los que tenían acceso a alimentos y los que tenían acceso a medicina, ya sea tradicional, eran los pueblos indígenas que se dedican a la agricultura. Porque, como en este caso que mencionas del parque de la papa, um, las comunidades han, han venido trabajando por más de 20 años en re relocalizar su sistema de alimentación con un enfoque indígena que es holístico. Los pueblos indígenas nunca se han separado de la naturaleza. Nosotros y la naturaleza somos uno. La madre tierra es sagrada y los principios que definen esa relación son los principios que se usan para hacer agricultura. El Parque de la Papa es una iniciativa de seis comunidades quechuas aquí en el Valle Sagrado de los Incas que se establece justamente para celebrar ese patrimonio biocultural, esa ciencia, tecnología, procesos de los sistemas agroalimentarios andinos para resolver problemas que se venían arrastrando por muchos años salud, alimentación, pobreza. Ahora, luego de estos 20 años, ¿qué es lo que hemos logrado? Uno, la relocalización de los, del sistema de alimentación ha significado diversificar los cultivos, especialmente dándole enfoque a los cultivos tradicionales, la papa, la quinoa, la kiwicha, todos aquellos que son aquí considerados superalimentos, son la base de la alimentación cotidiana de la población. Y el profundo respeto que se tiene por la madre tierra ha permitido que se pueda articular a procesos de investigación que tengan que ver con responder a eh, 
el caos que se vive aquí en las montañas andinas con el cambio climático. Los cultivos están subiendo rápido en, 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 la, en la verticalidad. Ya las papas están a 4.500 metros, el lugar más alto en el mundo donde se cultivan papas. Pronto no va a haber donde cultivar porque no se cultiva en las nubes. Entonces, con una colaboración con instituciones de investigación científicos, se ha podido lograr eh, dar respuestas a muchos de estos problemas a través de de crear diversidad gen genética, traer cultivos desde los bancos genéticos, adaptarlos, reintroducirlos, investigar sus usos, su valor nutricional y cómo se puede aplicar a productos bioculturales que tengan mercado y estén, pues, sobre todo articulados a cadenas eh, cortas. El Parque de la Papa tiene la más alta diversidad de, la, de papas en el mundo. Son casi 1.500 variedades que las comunidades mantienen. Especialmente las mujeres saben cómo se cocina cada uno, la textura, el sabor, con qué otro cultivo combina, con qué planta medicinal combina. Y fíjate, no ha habido ni un caso de COVID en estas 10.000 hectáreas que, de, que maneja el Parque de la Papa. Más allá, el Parque de la Papa llevó alimentos a la población del Cusco a lo, en lo alto de la pandemia cuando no había alimentos y la situación era grave. Esto hace ver que una agricultura localizada basada en principios siempre va a ser solidaria y puede ser la base para una transformación de los sistemas de, de alimentos. Ahora, yo pienso que los pueblos indígenas, más allá de haber sido reconocidos como los más eficientes en la conservación de la biodiversidad y tener una gran experiencia en el manejo, sobre todo, de, del caos y de las crisis. Vivimos acá con el niño por miles de años. Tenemos una agricultura de 10.000 años que ha domesticado más de 120 cultivos. Tenemos la capacidad, el conocimiento, la tecnología, los procesos, pero no tenemos los espacios porque siempre se ha practicado un sistema de alimentación basado y dominado solamente por la ciencia, donde no reconoce los derechos ni de la tierra, ni al conocimiento, ni a los modelos organizativos y económicos de los pueblos indígenas. El Parque de la Papa demuestra que procesos integrales, holísticos, son los más apropiados para poder responder a esta crisis existencial que tenemos con el cambio climático, la pandemia, el, esta... Eh, en crisis alimentaria que se viene y sobre todo mejorar los niveles de vida. Entonces pensamos nosotros que cualquier tipo de um, iniciativa de respuesta tiene que estar basado en derechos y en sobre todo respetar este punto de vista que tienen los pueblos indígenas que es eh, de una ética profunda de respeto a la tierra. Gracias. Te paso el micro. Creo que tu micro está apagado. Wow. Muchísimas gracias, Alejandro. Thank you so very, very much for that most compelling account. For showing how um, traditional knowledge can be, it must be brought together and considered together with uh, scientific knowledge. How traditional knowledge is also uh, an irreplaceable source of biocultural heritage um, and how it can contribute to building truly resilient societies. So 
With that, thank you. With that most compelling account, I would like to turn to um, Maria Yolanda. <clears throat> now, building on what Alejandro has just said, as an indigenous woman from the Quechua nation of Ecuador, what particular health challenges do you face in your community? And how can we strengthen resilience to climate change and biodiversity loss at the community level based on your experience? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Cristina, for inviting us to participate. Um, I prepared my, <laughs> my small talk in English, so I will try to do in that. And, and so, but I would like to begin giving my thanks to my brother, um, Alejandro. He put uh, the, the message very beautifully. Thank you so much. So I would like to start by saying that indigenous peoples have our own epistemologies, cosmovision, sciences, practices, innovations, proper ways of feeling, thinking, and being. For us, Mother Air is vital for our existence. She is alive and has sacred, secret, seen, and unseen beings, which are interconnected and interrelated. This fact has support the relationships, the harmony, balance, and the health of all her ecosystems. From ancestral times, indigenous peoples are the guardians and custodians of modern nature. Traditional knowledge has been transmitted orally from one generation to the next, together with indigenous languages, culture, values, principles, mandates, customary, and natural laws. Our elders always keep saying that every geographical region has a close relationship with an animal, plant, mountain, river, stone, sun, prayer, and so on. Through a deep observation, learning by doing, and reading some elements of the Mother Earth, indigenous peoples knew what was going to happen in their land and territories. For instance, uh, if a specific plant was carrying um, uh, too much uh, uh, small fruit, so the elders knew that in that specific year uh, uh, is going to be a lot of produce for the community. Observing the clouds, their shape and color, the elders knew the quantity of rain that will be in, the, in that area. Due to our close relationship with Mother Air from ancestral times to current times, we have developed the capacity to solve in practical ways several problems based on our resilience, which means based in our deep and democratic dialogues, in our systems of knowledge, in our capacity and decision making. Our resilience is also based in our biocultural community protocols and values such as gratitude, generosity, solidarity, reciprocity, care one another, respect for all beings, respect for the orality, consideration, honesty, and transparency. The contemporary model of development depends very much on new activities, such as the timber industry, destructive mining, mining projects, the opening of new roads in cultural and biological sensitive areas, mono plantations, etc. This model has resulted in the displacement of indigenous peoples from our ancestral territories in the invisibility and the lack of recognition and implementation of indigenous individual and collective human rights, and also in the lack of intercultural policies for indigenous people's holistic well-being. This development is killing our natural pharmacies, natural medicines, our uh, traditional knowledge and culture that was gained in thousands of years. The lack of trees, for instance, has logical consequences, the disappearance of native flora and fauna, the lack of rain, the erosion of soil, the cultural erosion, the poverty, extreme poverty, and the loss of our, our ancestral lands caused by the ir irrational use of natural resources. In regard to your question, indigenous people's resilience to climate change, bio biodiversity loss, would be strengthened when states, national and local authorities ensure the land tenure and demarcation 
and the secure use of the resources, decide to include indigenous peoples in the whole process of rebuilding the nations during and after the pandemic with the sustainable uh, budgets, with the recognition and implementation of our systems of knowledge and the, with, uh, with the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples in the whole process of an intercultural planning and policies elaboration regarding to our livelihoods. We must have in mind that in our indigenous vision, all elements are interconnected. Therefore, climate change plays a significant role on, a, on the health and well-being of humanity and Mother Earth. It is affecting our life, our causa, in rural and urban areas too. If our goal is to save us and Mother Nature, we must join efforts and work together as friends and partners. We need to create a minga for the life and work within a framework of human rights, safeguards, social and environmental justice, trust, and good faith. We are ready to work with all of you, either on the field or at the national and international meetings to stop biodiversity loss, to achieve one health for all, for all and the collective summa causa for the humankind and the mother earth. Also, we must remember that it's our responsibility to keep a healthy mother earth to live a good inheritance for the generations that are coming behind us. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Maria Yolanda. Thank you so much for reminding us of this need for a holistic vision of this, this, this need to remember um, people and nature as intrinsically uh, interconnected. As uh, Canary had said earlier as well, we are nature and nowhere has that been uh, more apparent than in the examples and the words that you and Alejandro have uh, provided. In fact, it's clear that the threats uh, that are posed by biodiversity loss right now and by climate change to uh, indigenous peoples are not only uh, environmental threats, they are in fact for many indigenous um, people and, and local communities very much existential threats. So thank you very much for sharing those beautiful intimate accounts and, and also um, uh, for, for sharing the ways forward, how we can meaningfully engage um, with indigenous and local communities to build social and ecological resilience moving forward. So thank you. And with that, uh, we don't have too much time, but maybe we can take uh, one or maybe one or two quick questions for the from the audience because um, I think we would like to open it up to all speakers to engage. So I'm looking through some of the questions. The first one I've come across here is from um, is from Leticia Santos de Lima who asks, given that bushmeat consumption is intimately related to culture in some regions of the world, how can we work together to avoid health and biodiversity challenges while respecting people's cultures and local communities? So I think that a very great many of our speakers that are on this panel today could uh, very much speak to that. So. I think um, perhaps to begin on that point, I would like to invite uh, Elizabeth Maremma. Thank you, thank you very much. For that specific question, I think we need to go back to a bit of history. Local communities, indigenous peoples have lived with a number of these species time immemorial. And they have depended also on, those, on their environment, traditional knowledge, culture from these species and lived with them in harmony 
for their food security, medicines, and livelihood. It is the selfish appetites of us city dwellers and those from affluent uh, class who are able to afford to buy wild species. And of course, as the result then pushing the market into the cities and interfering with the wild, uh, wild species space where the local communities have lived in harmony with them time immemorial. So that is one. And as the result of that, because of these increased markets of the sweet, uh, affluent city, uh, city dwellers have led also to uh, increasing, of course, the pressure of the, those wild spaces and that interference. So there's that one reason. So if we could leave the local communities to continue to live in harmony in those traditional lands, we will get back to where uh, the situation was safe. And we know their cultural values have also uh, uh, conserved biodiversity and ecosystems. And the best practices are there. Some have already been demonstrated even in the, uh, from the different panels. Of course, again, we come into, as the result uh, of our, uh, population move from the rural areas to the urban cities and increase the population, particularly in the cities that have also increased the, the agricultural production. And of course, our unsustainable consumption have further uh, increased illegal trade in wildlife. Again, to satisfy the urban demands, our selfish demands and our unsustainable demands. So there are all these, which Marco had indicated, transformative changes which are needed. Our own consumption patterns, our own ways, and let uh, the local communities, uh, uh, indigenous peoples, traditional knowledge to continue to conserve biodiversity while maintaining the livelihood of their societies. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. And maybe to comment on that as well, um, we would like to hear the uh, indigenous uh, communities themselves since they are uh, those that are uh, directly affected. So I would like to invite maybe Alejandro, would you uh, like to say a few words to answer that question? Um, uh, muchas gracias. Um, Creo que eh, este momento que vivimos es único y ha magnificado todo. Y algo que ha magnificado es de que eh, lo que llamamos modernidad y las soluciones basados en eh, balas de, como lo llaman, silver bullets, de, no funcionan más. Y debemos reimaginar un mundo que tenga esos principios de balance entre los humanos, la naturaleza y lo sagrado. Acá lo que hace mucho falta, y esto omite mucho la ciencia um, occidental, es la falta del espíritu en lo que hacemos. Yo creo que una ética que pueda ser mucho más uh, holística es necesaria. Y pienso que eh, en este momento eh, las soluciones tienen que empezar desde lo local. Tiene que haber un tejido. Tenemos que hacer un tapestry global de diferentes soluciones, de diferentes posibilidades, de diferentes modos de hacer la cosa. Yo creo que no hay una sola solución, un solo modelo y... En todo esto, si me permites, yo tengo un poco de temor a estas nuevas propuestas como las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, porque siempre ven a la naturaleza como si fuera algo ajeno al humano y quieren monetarizar, ven cómo hacer eh, finanzas con algo que es sagrado. Entonces, yo creo que este tipo de 
eh, <coughs> propuestas de soluciones tienen que tener una fuerte vinculación con los derechos humanos. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Alejandro. Um, we are uh, running a little bit short on time, it appears, but we, but we do need uh, to hear some final wise word from, words from this incredible panel of speakers. So if you can keep it very brief, uh, we would invite you to make one one minute closing statement. If, if you have less than a minute, uh, what is it that you would like to say to to the people uh, watching? So maybe to shake things up a little, we would like to start with you. I think you were muted when you said who, or was I? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Carolina, since you brought it to my attention, we would like to start with you. <laughs> I was kind of scared it was me from the beginning. Thank you so much, Christina. So I think really what we've learned uh, very painfully uh, over this year is the importance of making the linkages between the most important environmental issues of our time more visible and more understandable to our communities. And we've heard today about the rural and the urban sort of in a separated context, but it's, it's so important to start in spaces such as this one to join these two uh, universes that sometimes seem so separated in policy terms into the same space. So I appreciate every uh, speaker today for giving us that opportunity to think collectively about how these issues are really challenges for both the urban and the rural. Thank you so much, Christina, for your beautiful moderating as well. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, and uh, perhaps moving next to Kinari, some words of wisdom from, from you. I just really want to echo what Alejandra said about how this is, um, I'm also very nervous about the monetizing of nature. And even though I told you all of those amazing carbon numbers, right? We're not monetizing carbon and we don't want to. For us, it's an intrinsic thing. It is all of us giving thank yous to each other. The global community honoring and respecting indigenous communities, asking them what the solutions are and then supporting them in that. And in return, they have beautiful gifts to give back to the world. But from my perspective, it needs to be mutual gift giving and understanding the sacredness and the beauty and the honor of this planet and not just turning it into a monetary transaction. And there's lots of data that shows when we do that, we actually end up worse off and better off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kinari. And now I would invite um, uh, Maria Yolanda. Sí, este, muchas gracias. Um, como un pensamiento final, lo que quisiera es llamar a todos a reconocernos como hermanos, a reconocernos como hijos de la Madre Tierra eh, y por lo tanto eh, a, a unirnos en un círculo. Para los pueblos indígenas el círculo es un espacio sagrado donde todos tienen un sitio y todos tienen una voz para decir lo que piensan. Entonces unámonos, trabajemos juntos. Eh, como decía, me parece que fue Marco que decía eh, tenemos que tener un plan de acción ahora y como lo decía Carolina que esas, ese plan de acción eh, esté basado realmente en, en soluciones prácticas en soluciones locales lo local es lo que realmente nos va a dar fuerza para poder avanzar hacia lo nacional y lo internacional en el mundo indígena trabajamos juntos hombres y mujeres jóvenes y niños ancianos todos todos eh, hacemos un todo con la finalidad de arrimar el hombro y juntos eh, buscar soluciones. Las mejores soluciones tanto para nosotros como seres humanos, como también para nuestra madre tierra. Gracias. Muchas 
Muchas gracias, Maria Yolanda, for summarizing that so beautifully. And finally, uh, we would like to turn to uh, maybe maybe Marco, since she drew on your words. Uh, perhaps you can come in with some final words of wisdom. Sure, no, sure. Word of wisdom, but sounds final words for sure. Uh, but thank you, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Let me let me say first of all, let me echo Alejandro and Maria Orlando. I think they're absolutely right, uh, and 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 Kinari as well has added to that. Uh, ways to live sustainably are different depending on your context and where you live and what, what kind of reality you're part of. So uh, there is no one size fits all, and I think that's a really really important point. Um, the second point that I would like to highlight is that, particularly looking at the drivers of, uh, of pandemics like COVID, uh, whether it is deforestation or wildlife trade or, or in industrial uh, farming, um, all this, most of that is linked to our food system, the way we consume and produce food. And I think this is where our society needs to really focus in the next uh, decade to really fix this not only broken relationship with nature, but broken relationship with food. And we have to learn a lot by uh, the localized approach that Yolanda and Alejandro has actually mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for that, Marco. And uh, for some final words now from Peter. Well, thanks very much, everybody. This is really inspirational. I, you know, I, I want to take us all back. This has been a horrible year with this pandemic, but let's try and remember in February, March, when much of the planet went onto a lockdown and we saw a vision of the future where we saw the, um, uh, the, the skies above Beijing become clear, where we saw the canals of Venice become clear and crisp again and fish came back. We saw wildlife return to our cities and our parks in, in an unprecedented way. Um, it cannot last like that um, forever. We cannot go on lockdown. But what it did is it gave us a vision of a future, which we all um, would value very highly. Uh, it is achievable. It is an achievable future. A future that's more sustainable comes at a slight cost, but we should bear that cost. Because as we pay for that, we get a return on our investment that's just incredible. It's a healthier planet. It's healthier within ourselves and it's a healthier mind and spirit. And I think that is something we all want to do and leave for our children and grandchildren. So thanks for inviting me tonight and I look forward to working with you to get there. Thank you very, very much for those closing words, Peter. And uh, now for the closing statement, we have a lovely surprise for you. We now would like to invite the Honorable Minister of Environment of Costa Rica, Her Excellency Andrea Meza Murillo. Señora la Ministra, the floor is yours. Hi, Cristina. This is Daniela Villalta instead of Minister Mesa. She has been uh, called to, to another meeting uh, and I am presenting her apologies for not being able to, to join uh, to this session. But um, in, in, her, uh, in her place, I wanted to just read some uh, few messages that she um, uh, was, was going to, to address. So um, if I may read her message uh, on this is today our societies face unprecedented times and as many stakeholders join also forces to reflect on the way forward to the world. We want to build, it's essential to reflect upon the fact that the current health crisis is a crisis based on a sonotic origin. This is a result of our unbalanced relationship, just as uh, all the speakers have said already. And it, it is with uh, the unbalanced relationship with the natural environment and the unsustainable management of species and the pressures that we have put on natural habitats. 
this nexus between the climate change, biodiversity, and health crisis were imminent just uh, years before. And the COVID-19 crisis has dramatically shown how unprecedented the global economy is um, unprepared for these systemic risks, despite the warnings of the community, uh, of the scientific community. However, these impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss can lead us to new scenarios of major stocks that will impact welfare, the ability to generate wealth, generate more uh, social turbulence, migrations, and many others. To avoid these such catastrophic scenarios, science and the Paris Agreement sets a global of zero, zero net emissions by 2050 and to achieve the protection of 30% of the planet, both land and marine areas, according to the CBD convention. Opportunities to address these three health crises, climate change, health, extinction of our biodiversity are time bound. Climate models shows that we are approaching a tipping point. If current trends in habitat conversion and emissions do not peak by 2030, then it will become impossible to remain below 1.5 degrees. Similar if current land uh, conversion rates, poaching of, of large animals, invasive species, pollution and over exploitation and other threats are not markedly showed. At a whole of a government and a whole of society approach, it is important to promote long-term strategies and NDCs, enhanced NDCs that cover the entire economy and establish technological roadmaps to achieve decarbonization and resilience, as well as nature-based solutions. In this sense, it is critical to ensure that while we work towards recovery plans and build back better, we must ensure that both the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis are taken into account as opportunities to address this interconnected crisis. We need more ambitious actions to reconstruct properly, putting nature as a cornerstone of our green recovery plans and to enable green financial flows and aim for a transformative change. Regarding finance, the synergies between climate, biodiversity go beyond nature-based solutions, greenhouse gas emission reductions through fossil fuel phase out, energy demand, demand reduction, sustainable consumption and sustainable land use. Therefore, there should be a shift in thinking that the processes are competing for resources. Protection of biodiversity will have positive impact on climate change and action on, on mitigation and adaptation will also have positive impact in biodiversity and also as health. The policies in the national commitments through NDCs and biodiversity should maximize synergies between climate and biodiversity trade-offs. I wish to finalize this intervention by saying that we are living through a decisive and critical moment. COVID-19 offers the opportunity for a transformative change and implementation of green reconstruction and sustainable, and sustainable economy, aiming and generating well-being. If we protect nature, nature will protect us and with clean air, with clean, clean water and better health and several other priceless ecological services and many other benefits to our society. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Daniela, for those inspiring words and for reading them on behalf of Minister Murillo. As uh, one of the founding members, actually, of the High Ambition Coalition for Nature, Costa Rica is certainly leading by example on how we can harness nature to support health um, promoting and to, and to create health promoting environments while tackling climate change. So those were very powerful remarks to end this session. And with, the, with that, I would like to thank all our distinguished panelists for having joined us for a wonderful uh, session. I also thank uh, my fellow WHO colleagues 
um, some of whom have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event possible. Our partners, Global and Climate Health Alliance, and um, all, our, all our partners for this session and on this panel for making it possible. And of course, to um, all of you for joining us here today. So we, with one final closing word, we do have one more exciting session in store for you uh, for under the Climate and Health Dialogues. And that will be the race for adaptation and resilience. So another crucially important cross-cutting theme uh, to be discussed. And that session is going to begin at 2 a.m. Uh, universal time. So that would be very early in the morning for people in, in Europe, but also um, at, at, at uh, in at a better time actually for people in the Pacific and that session will indeed have a number of speakers from uh, small island developing states who of course are particularly vulnerable to uh, climate change. So with that thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Indeed, thank you so much.